All right, we're in, uh, we're in Acts. We're going to do our little uh, background uh, here on the book of Acts. Today as we begin uh, our new study. And, uh, and just to tell you right, right up front, to warn you, it will be a little lecture-like in terms of lots of, lots of information, but hopefully uh, it'll help us lay a foundation so that we'll appreciate uh, who Luke is, uh, who he was to the Apostle Paul, his, uh, his writing, and... Uh, uh, and what makes uh, this particular book uh, very, very special, very in, important to us. Title is simply Acts. Sometimes you'll have Acts of the Apostles. Some have said it should say Acts of some of the Apostles because it really focuses on Peter and it focuses on the Apostle Paul. Uh, some have said it should be the Acts of the, of the Holy Spirit upon the lives of some of the Apostles because there certainly is a focus on uh, the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in their lives. We're going to see them dramatically changed uh, as, uh, uh, as the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them there in chapter 2. Uh, G. Campbell Morgan, the great British preacher, said, The story has impressed me with the glorious regularity of the irregular in the work of the church by the Holy Spirit. Can't put the Holy Spirit in a box and say, It's always going to be this way, always going to work this way. We're going to see... Uh, we're going to see the great ir irregularity in how God uh, works through his Holy Spirit in the lives of these men. Uh, A.W. Tozer said at one point in time uh, in, the, in his life, writing a lot in, in the 50s and, uh, and so forth, early 60s, now looking back at some of the things he said uh, seemed to be almost prophetic. But he talked about the fact that uh, uh, if in the church today, and this is uh, back a few uh, decades, of course, he says, if in the church today you remove the Holy Spirit, 95% of what we do would continue on. But if you remove the Holy Spirit from the early church, 95% of what they did would completely <coughs> cease. It would not happen. So we're going to look at a group of men and women that were empowered by the Holy Spirit uh, and what he did in and through their lives, uh, imperfect uh, as they are. Well, let's look at the uh, first point is the, the purpose and the themes of the book and, and uh, move through these pretty quickly, but one is uh, a little more important than others. One is to present uh, history. It's the founding of the church, spread of the gospel, evangelistic events, uh, the missionary uh, journeys uh, of the Apostle Paul. Uh, secondly, to give a, a defense. Uh, remember that uh, the church is under persecution, uh, not only from, uh, uh, from uh, the Jews uh, there that had rejected Jesus in Jerusalem, but eventually uh, by Rome and the Roman government as well. Luke is writing while the Apostle Paul is awaiting trial. By the time we get to uh, chapter 28, the Lord doesn't return, and we get there. Uh, by the time we get there, uh, we'll have the Apostle Paul on his way and arriving in Rome. Uh, and uh, while he is there awaiting trial, uh, Luke uh, then pins uh, this particular book. Uh, it's here to provide uh, guides and models because we're going to see how to preach the gospel. We're going to see how to plant a church, how to send out missionaries. There's models uh, all, all the way through uh, and guides that can uh, help us. We'll talk more about that in a moment. It's uh, to show us uh, what a church looks like under persecution and how even under persecution, uh, the spread of the gospel can uh, continue. <clears throat> and uh, this becomes more rele relative to us uh, with this week, Governor Abercrombie signing into law same-sex marriage because along with that, of course, it doesn't just establish the right of uh, people of the same sex to be married. Uh, it puts into play a whole host of, uh, of litigation uh, and lawsuits that will be against people that oppose that, whether you say something on the workplace uh, or uh, you have a business that refuses to cater to a particular uh, wedding or activity associated with that, whether you're a photographer, uh, whether you bake cakes, whether you have a facility, uh, whatever, whatever it might be. It's not speculation. This is exactly... Uh, what has happened in other states once this has passed. We've talked about the fact that the curriculum uh, in our schools will be changed all the way down to the elementary school uh, levels. And, uh, and we'll try to keep you abreast on what's going on with all of that. But all of that puts limits uh, on our religious freedom. Uh, we see those uh, uh, changing each and every day. I don't know if you even know, it's just for example, because we've got Thanksgiving coming up. You notice all the beautiful Thanksgiving decorations in all the stores? Ah, no, they go from black and orange to red and green. Uh, there is no Thanksgiving. That Christian holiday, remembering the pilgrims uh, in their Thanksgiving uh, to the Lord. Uh, we don't want that in our culture, our society. 
you'll hear phrases and used by our current president, former Secretary of State, <coughs> they'll use the phrase, the importance of the freedom of worship, not religion. In other words, you can go in your building to worship, just don't bring it out here. Uh, uh, we've, we're replacing words, uh, and they have significance, and they have meaning. So we're certainly not being persecuted like many around the world, but uh, our world here uh, in this country is, uh, is changing. Uh, Acts provides a, a model of what it's like for a church living and prospering under persecution. It'll trace the shift from the church being, uh, being primarily only Jewish uh, and a Jewish sect uh, to actually uh, to where the Gentiles outnumber the Jewish believers in one generation. Uh, and that's an important <coughs> concept to see as, as well. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons is because uh, one of the purposes of Luke's writing is to help us understand that. Uh, that uh, the early Christians were known as the way. Uh, we'll read a verse in, in a little bit where in Syria, Antioch, they're first called Christians, but it was meant to be a, a derogatory term, uh, but it sticks. But early on, as you had within Judaism, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Herodians, and the way, uh, they, we were, the Christians were, just another sect of Judaism. Uh, Luke wants to try to make that clear because there's no persecution against Jews. Uh, therefore, there should be no persecutions against those of the way, those that are following Jesus as the Messiah. He'll feature trials of the Apostle Paul uh, and make reference to them in detail so the writers could read and understand he was found innocent at in all of these trials. Uh, he's, in a sense, making a case for why there should not be persecution uh, against believers. That's one of the purposes uh, of his writing as well. Uh, it's to provide details, uh, again, a pivotal time or transition from the Gospels to the Epistles. Uh, if we didn't have, have the book of Acts, we would read, we'd study the Gospels and then go to Romans and go, how did that get there? You know, uh, Philippi, how did the church get there? You know, but uh, uh, Acts helps uh, fill in the gap and explain that transition time. And then uh, very importantly, it provides, as I mentioned, a model for the church. I can tell a lot about a person's theology very quickly by asking them what they think about the book of Acts. Was it just a transition period of time for the church living <laughs> under persecution, uh, or is it a model for us to follow? And they're going to fall into one of two categories, because if they say it was just a transition period, that means the model for them becomes from the early church fathers. Who are, who are living and writing uh, late, uh, late, uh, you know, early, four, late 4th century, 5th century, 6th century. They're going to take Augustine. They're going to take those church fathers, quote, uh, and use them in their teachings as to how the church should look like, worship, operate, how to interpret scripture, and so forth, <clears throat> how to preach the gospel. And, uh, uh, but uh, in reality... Uh, we know from the words of Jesus that he's got a problem with the church by 90 AD. From the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus is already trying to rebuke and correct the church uh, that existed at that time. In Revelation 2, 4, he says to the church at Ephesus, which was an awesome church at one time, but by 90 AD, Jesus <coughs> says, nevertheless, I have this against you that you've left your first love. So there's a problem in terms of motivation already within the church by 90 AD. And by Re in uh, verse 14, Jesus goes on and says, again, being penned by the apostle John, uh, but I have a few things against you because you have, uh, you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which uh, thing I hate, repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So, and, we, and we could go on. Jesus is, by 90 AD, is saying there's some doctrinal and motivational problems within the church. Well, how are we doing 300 years later? Uh, probably not too good. Do we really want to use that as the model for what a church should look like, operate like, and, uh, and so forth? Uh, and so therefore, we look at the book of Acts and believe that it is the model for us. Yes, was it a transitionary time? Yes. Was it a church under persecution? Yes. But it still has all the basic models there for what the church should look like. 
you know, we studied Romans together and we learned all about our salvation, security of salvation, other very important issues and things that uh, are very meaningful to each and every one of us personally. But this book is for us corporately as the church together to study together. Uh, this is a book about the church, the history of the church that we're part of, and it tells us how to be the church, uh, how to be a witness, how to share the gospel, how to share the gospel with somebody that's Jewish versus somebody that's a Gentile. We've got the only sermon of Paul in Acts 17 preaching primarily to a Gentile crowd. So there's a lot that we can learn from the book of Acts in terms of uh, it being a model. Uh, the purpose and the themes of the book are essential. They're important. Secondly, the particular characteristics of the book. Uh, and one of them is uh, the characteristic of, characteristic of its historical accuracy. Uh, details, cultural differences, settings. Uh, Luke includes 80 geographical references. He mentions over 100 people by name. Uh, and he goes into great detail uh, about these things. Uh, and it's important because then, as the archaeologist digs in Israel today uh, and around the ancient Roman world, he finds that it's exactly the way Luke said it, uh, that it was. Uh, describing in detail places, uh, important officials, uh, and so forth. Every time that there's something uncovered in the Middle East that applies to the first century, that ties with the Apostle Paul and the events of the early church, we get a greater, once again, validity for the accuracy of Luke. Uh, even secular people say he was a first-rate historian. Uh, of course, we believe he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but uh, we're going to see some epic scenes and places he describes, courtroom settings and so forth. Uh, we were able to see one of those, or the remains of one of those, in our uh, trip to Israel uh, a couple of years ago. The first day you leave Tel Aviv, you go north just a little bit. There's a beautiful uh, Roman amphitheater that's still there that's been uh, uncovered. Uh, uh, it's in that area that there was a stone found uh, with an inscription uh, to Pontius Pilate. Uh, again, with his name, when he reigned, where he reigned, uh, authenticating because we had never found anything about him before. And the critics of the Bible said, this is a fictitious person. No, we've undercovered now. Uh, and there's a replica of that stone there. So that's pretty awesome to see. Something that wasn't there in our previous trip, then we walked out, it's right, right on the Mediterranean, uh, super blue water, beautiful day, fortunately for us. And we got to actually stand uh, in the courtroom where Paul holds these trials. Of course, uh, the building's not there, but the foundation, the mosaics on the floor, some of the pillars are there. You can see the place, see its size, and it doesn't take a lot of imagination. The picture of the Apostle Paul, knowing his words and what he had to say to Felix uh, and uh, Festus and Agrippa as he stood before them, not defending himself, but defending the gospel and preaching the gospel to them. Uh, again, the places that Luke talks about uh, have incredible historical accuracy. Secondly, one of the particular characteristics is its literary excellence. Um, Luke's writing is very different than the other, uh, the other apostles and the other New Testament writers. He combines classical Greek with Aramaic. He uses 700 words not found anywhere else in the New Testament. That probably may not seem like a lot, but uh, uh, when we were taking uh, Greek, uh, we, we found, we were told that uh, we were supposed to be memorizing uh, they had about 40 new words a week. So it was like, uh, I thought I was doing good, getting half of them, but uh, my teacher didn't. But uh, uh, anyway, you, they're coming fast and furious. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, the idea was that if you could memorize about 350 Greek words, you could pretty much translate a Greek manuscript back, back into English again, because you have the basic same words uh, same subject matter spoken about over and over again, about 350, 380. I didn't make it, but I'm just, you know, in theory, in theory, if you could memorize those. Luke uses 700 words uh, not found by uh, any other writer. So the language that he uses, classical Greek, of course, he's a medical doctor. So when he's describing an il illness, he describes it in medical terminology. Uh, when he's describing the, uh, the voyages uh, of the Apostle Paul and the one shipwreck off Malta, he uses the proper nautical terminology for everything, uh, something the other writers uh, did, uh, did not do. Uh, thirdly, uh, their characteristic is, well, dramatic descriptions. 
uh, speeches by Paul, by Peter, by Stephen, which is uh, uh, chapter 6, an awesome speech that he gives of the history of the Jews to the Sanhedrin, indicting all of them because they have rejected the, the men and the messengers and the prophets that God has sent all along. Of course, all of this uh, leading to his indictment and then his becoming the first martyr of, of the church. We've got, again, the first account of a shipwreck uh, in ancient literature anywhere given, as I said, uh, using the proper nautical terminology. Uh, it also gives an objective account. Uh, <clears throat> Luke doesn't uh, water anything down. He gives you the good, the bad, the ugly. He tells you when Paul and, and, uh, and Barnabas ha have a fight over whether they should take John Mark or not, and how they, they split up. He tells you the problems and the difficulties that, uh, that Peter and Paul have at one point or another. Uh, it's just not all the good things that happened to the church in the first 30 years of its history. He tells you everything. Uh, it's very objective. Uh, the, the last characteristic is, uh, is interesting. Just to uh, bring your attention to verse 8 of chapter 1. Uh, I hope possibly, if you haven't already, a good verse for you to memorize. Uh, and it uh, really breaks down the entire book in terms of an outline. Verse 8 says... Jesus speaking, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my uh, be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, uh, and to the ends of the earth. And certainly, uh, we'll look at this in some detail, the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit coming. We see the, uh, the uh, evidence of it in Acts chapter 2, uh, but it really can become the outline. In chapter 1 to chapter 8, verse 4, <clears throat> there's the witness in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uh, ends of the earth. Uh, we've got the Holy Spirit being poured out on Pentecost. Uh, we've got uh, all of the uh, uh, preaching of Peter there. We have the Ananias and Sapphira being slain in the Spirit. I'm not sure why people get excited about that because they took them out and buried them afterwards. But uh, uh, we have the first occasion of that great fear coming upon the church as a result. And as I mentioned, the imprisonment of Stephen, Stephen's speech before the Sanhedrin uh, and his being martyred in Jerusalem. Be my witnesses in Jerusalem. The second point uh, goes from chapter 8, verse 5 to chapter 12, verse 25. The witness in Judea and Samaria. Philip, remember, goes up to Samaria, uh, preaches the gospel. The Samaritans to receive it. God pours out his spirit. There's a great revival uh, in the city. Uh, uh, Peter and John go up there on their first, quote, uh, short missionary church, uh, trip. They see uh, what has happened, uh, and they are, they are transformed in their own theology, and they're thinking about the gospel, having re-seen uh, the Samaritans, because they're still thinking this is the Jewish deal, uh, and you've got to become Jewish to, to receive it, uh, and uh, the Lord uses that revival to open up their thinking. That was in Judea in Samaria. Also during that period of time of Judea and Samaria, now spreading out further, we have the conversion of the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road on his way to Syria to persecute uh, the church. We also now have Peter going out to the coast, uh, staying with uh, Simon the Tanner, uh, and then uh, men come to him from Cornelius' house. He makes his way back up to Joppa. Uh, to uh, Cornelius' house where he'll preach the gospel. And we have the Holy Spirit being poured out on other Gentiles at that point. That's all in the second point, the witness in Judea and Samaria. Then, from chapter 13 to 28, the spotlight shifts from Peter to Paul, and we have the, the ministry of Paul, Paul's three missionary journeys, uh, and then his imprisonment, uh, and then uh, eventually being taken to uh, to Rome. So the headquarters of the church during that period shifts from Jerusalem up to Antioch, Syria, uh, up there on the coast of uh, modern day Syria, close to where uh, Russia has a naval base right now, I'm trying to establish another one down in Egypt, but that's another story. But uh, a lot of things going on in the Middle East today. But Paul, again, is falsely accused of taking a Gentile into the temple. That's how it all begins. And then I mentioned the trials of Felix, Festus, and Agrippa. But he uh, uh, appeals to Caesar, and then he's off to Rome. So a lot of uh, very interesting uh, details. Date of the writing, uh, 62 AD, most conservative scholars. Paul is uh, beheaded outside Rome, martyred for his faith, 68 AD. It's got to happen before then, because he's still alive when we get to chapter 28. Uh, and the temple is destroyed in 70 AD. It's still up and running and, uh, and functioning. It's got to happen uh, it's got to be written, completed before then. 
Again, we think it's uh, around 62 AD. Purpose and themes, essential because it provides models of ministry. Because we don't want to go with what the church fathers said in the 5th century. Uh, who are already moved very far away from the Bible itself. Uh, they've begun to interpret the Bible as an allegory. It says this, but I think it means this. No, we need to get back to the Bible. Uh, and the model that we are given is in the book of Acts. The particular characteristics are important because of its accuracy, literary excellence, dramatic descriptions, and he does give us an objective account. Everybody still with me? All right, point three, the previous account of Jesus. We actually get into the text. Hallelujah, verses one and two. We're not going to get far, but I just thought I'd encourage you that a little bit there. Uh, verse one says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So Luke is writing, we say, to a person. And, uh, and he makes reference to this person in his uh, gospel account, uh, Luke, and he makes reference to him uh, in this account as well. But he makes a distinction uh, uh, how he addresses them, uh, and that's important. So uh, I want to read to you the uh, opening of Luke's gospel where he mentions Theophilus. There he writes, Luke 1, 1, inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative the telling of the story of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So uh, Luke is writing a man named Theophilus. It means a lover of God. The distinction between the two, what I just read and what I previously read, is the way he addresses him. Uh, in the gospel, he refers to him as most excellent Theophilus. That is the title for a Roman official. <coughs> Theophilus is a Roman official. Uh, we'll try to uh, make reference to the fact that we believe uh, based on some other uh, writings outside the Bible, that he lives in Antioch, Syria. Uh, and he's a Roman official there. Now, when he writes him a second time uh, here in Acts, instead of saying, most excellent Theophilus, basically he just says, yo, Theo. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just his name. So something happened. Something changed. He doesn't address him the same way. Uh, most Bible commentators believe that Theophilus read the gospel, believed the gospel, and has come to faith uh, in Jesus Christ. So therefore, it's not necessary any longer for Luke to address him as a Roman official. Uh, we don't do that. and We don't do that in church. Nobody does, shouldn't do that in church. Uh, we don't care about people's outside titles uh, somewhere else. We're just brothers and sisters in Christ. We're here to worship the Lord. Uh, we're here to study the word. We're here, we're here to fellowship. Uh, it's probably uh, 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 very striking, uh, for, you know, especially for the folks in, uh, in the military world where there, <laughs> there is definite ranking and definite uh, uh, protocol and everything, but uh, uh, we don't really get into it. We don't really care. You know, we, we love to hear when somebody's doing well and the, the Lord's blessing, they're advancing rank. That, that's, that's awesome. But, uh, but we don't really care. You know, it's like uh, Fred, Fred that's here with us uh, uh, a lot of times, Fred is usually the gray-haired guy sitting on a stool playing the acoustic guitar over here. Uh, when he's with us, him and Carolyn uh, have uh, uh, chosen for some reason, because all their kids and grandkids live on the mainland. I, I don't get that, but uh, they've chosen to live at least part of the time there back on the, uh, the East Coast. But they're, they're with us about uh, seven months uh, out, out of the year. But uh, Fred's a, a semi-retired federal judge. He keeps He's retired about three times, but he keeps keeps working. So I think his wife has given up and just he's semi-retired. But uh, uh, nobody calls Fred the judge. Now my dad does. My dad calls him the judge. But uh, it's just, I maybe can't remember his name, so that works. But I don't know. I think he gets a kick out of it or something. But uh, uh, we don't care. It's uh, it's just Fred. It's just Fred. Uh, that is, that's the way it is in the body of Christ. Uh, that's the implication here with Theophilus. He's read the gospel, uh, believed the gospel, uh, and now we have a different uh, reference to him uh, here. So Luke is writing a person, and uh, their relationship together 
is one of a little bit of speculation, but uh, uh, we have some uh, very uh, interesting evidence that certainly points to the fact that Theophilus uh, is probably paid for Luke to go to medical school. He's probably his slave. Now we're going to go through some verses and talk about Luke in a moment, his relationship with Paul, and it's very e easy to establish the fact that Luke is a Gentile. So we have a Gentile writer of a gospel uh, and of a major portion of scripture here uh, in the New Testament as well, and certainly that's, uh, that's an uh, important, although the guy, you'll hear guys try to make a case for uh, the fact that Luke is Jewish, but uh, I'll just show, show you, uh, not according to Apostle Paul. Uh, uh, but also the fact that uh, uh, not only uh, Jewish, he's probably Greek. And that, uh, that has something to come into play in terms of why he would have been sent to medical school and where and when he actually got saved. We know it was very popular in the first century among Romans to, to send their Greek slaves in particular to uh, to law school, medical school, uh, and so forth. It was, uh, uh, they loved to, to do it. Remember, the Romans had no culture. They had an awesome military. They had no culture. They just kind of stole the Greek culture and, uh, and made it their own. <clears throat> so even though they had Greek slaves, they held them in high esteem. It was a very popular thing to send them, a man like Theophilus, a Roman official, to send them uh, to medical school uh, either way, Luke is a doctor, he is a physician, uh, and he has a relationship with this man, uh, and many people believe that's the relationship. Well, uh, secondly, it's not just writing to a person, this is the follow-on, I wrote you this, and now I'm going to record this for you, that's who it's addressed to, uh, but it's very important to note, secondly, Luke is writing as the personal companion to the Apostle Paul. <laughs> Luke's a companion to Paul during his missionary journeys. And we'll see that in the first 16 chapters up to verse 9, uh, Luke is writing in the second person. They did this. They went there. They saw this. They experienced that. When we get to chapter 16, verse 10, that all changes. It goes to uh, a first person plural uh, in, as in verse 10. And I'll read you a few of these verses just to make it uh, obvious and uh, here at the end, make a point. Uh, verse 10, now, after he, Paul, had seen the vision, immediately we, there it is, that's the first mention of the second person plural, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, or we say Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony, and we were staying in that city for some days. So it continues on. So from chapter 16, we know that wherever Paul went, Luke was there. Uh, everything Paul experienced, Luke experienced it uh, right along with him. And we see this concluding in chapter 28, verse 16. Now when we came to Rome, Centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself, the soldier who guarded him. So he's there on this whole journey. He's with him in Jerusalem when he gets accused of taking a Gentile in. He's, he's, uh, when he's ushered out of the city uh, 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 at night by special, special, or special Roman guard, <coughs> Luke is with him. Uh, when he's held in prison in, uh, in Caesarea Philippi, uh, Caesarea, Luke is, is with him. He's with him in the shipwreck. He's with him through all of these things. Therefore, when they shipwreck off of uh, uh, off the uh, Greek islands there, uh, and they uh, take uh, the, the boards of the ship and they ride them through the surf, sometimes that's called surfing when you have a board and you ride it through the surf, uh, we know that Luke was also surfing with him. We just don't know if they stood up, but we know they <laughs> threw the boards in through, through the surf. Luke, Luke experiences all, all of these things. A couple other things about him. He's mentioned a few other times in Paul's epistles. One of them is in, in, uh, in Colossians. Uh, there, in chapter 4, verse 10, Paul writes, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, <coughs> greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instruction. Becomes you, you welcome him. And uh, Jesus, or Jesus, who is called Justice, uh, these are my only fellow workers 
for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. These are the only Jews that are, that are with me. He just said that. These are the only Jews that are with me. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, also laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I, for I bear him witness that he has great zeal for you, and those who are in uh, uh, Laodicea, uh, and those in Hierapolis. Verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Luke is not included with the Jewish brothers that he's mentioned previously. He names them and says, these are the only Jewish guys I got with me. And then, and then he mentions that the, the other Gentiles. So we know that uh, Luke is uh, with the Apostle Paul uh, in, uh, in all these trials and tribulations. Uh, we know that he's a physician. Uh, he's a doctor. And if anybody needed a personal physician, it was the Apostle Paul. The guy was uh, getting beat to death every time he, uh, he turned around. Uh, and it refers to Luke as the beloved uh, physician. Uh, he's definitely a Gentile. Now let's go to Philemon. Makes a reference to Luke there as, as well. Very important. Verse 23. Only one chapter. Uh, Paphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you as uh, do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. So what this means is Luke was uh, uh, not just the companion of the Apostle Paul. He was not just a friend of the Apostle Paul. He didn't just travel with him. He wasn't just a doctor and his personal physician. He, was a, he preached the gospel. He was a fellow laborer. He gets mentioned right along with everybody else, which, of course, makes Luke the first medical missionary. He's literally out there as a doctor caring for people, but he's also out there preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ just like everybody else. So sometimes we have this kind of idea in our mind that, Luke was just kind of, kind of slumped around uh, the Apostle Paul, followed him in the shadow and uh, changed his bandages once in a while. Uh, but no, he was out there uh, preaching the gospel just like uh, everyone else. Now, to show you the extent of their relationship and how long uh, Luke was with uh, Paul, uh, we now turn to 2 Timothy 4.9. Now remember, Luke's made reference, and we'll make reference to arriving in Rome, uh, being delivered into uh, a prison there, but the prison was like a, uh, a Hilton as far as prisons. Paul was in his own uh, rented house. Yeah, he had Roman guards attached to him, uh, which they were thrilled, of course, to hear uh, about the gospel all day long, every day, until you know many of them are converted. Uh, but a pretty comfortable setting. He's a Roman citizen, uh, and he's awaiting trial before Caesar. He stands before Caesar. This goes beyond the book of Acts. He stands before Caesar, uh, and he is released, uh, and we know he continues to preach the gospel and get as far as he can uh, to uh, you know Western Europe. Uh, he is rearrested uh, and now brought back to Rome, and now he's in prison the second time in the Maritime prison. I don't have a, a big desire to go to Rome, but uh, if I did, if I were ever there, all the things to see. This is what I. This is where I'd like to go. <laughs> I'd like to go to the Maritime prison, uh, which is a hole in the ground. Uh, still there, the stocks are still there where the Apostle Paul was held uh, and it's, uh, 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 it's dirty, it's dark, it's full of rats uh, and, uh, and cold and wet. And you say, you want to go there? Well, well, kind of. Not for a long time, but just a little, a little while, just to see where Paul was. But that's where he is. And he's writing Timothy, one of the young guys he writes, uh, raised up in the ministry. He knows he's about ready to be martyred for his faith. He knows he's going to die. Uh, and he writes these final words uh, to Timothy 4, 9. Be diligent to come, come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Uh, in, in the end, Luke is the only guy that's there. And church history does tell us that it's Luke that gives the body of the Apostle Paul and make sure he has a, a proper burial afterwards. So when we say that Luke was his companion, he was probably his closest friend. Luke probably knew Paul better than anybody else on, on this planet. He was, when he met him and set out, basically uh, he was a guy that never left his side. Uh, you know, he raised up a whole team of people, which is, again, a, a model for us to do ministry. And he had young guys like Timothy and like Titus, 
and others he was constantly sending out uh, and so forth. But Luke wasn't one of them. He was a fellow laborer who was preaching the gospel. God was using him, but he seemed to never leave the Apostle Paul's side. He's there uh, in terms of his, uh, even at his final, <coughs> final hours of, of life on this planet. Now, I mentioned uh, the idea of, uh, uh, of Luke and when, when he got saved. And uh, I just want to make uh, reference to a, a couple of things and a couple of things uh, outside of Scripture that maybe give us some clues uh, about that. Oh, over in Acts 11, in verse 19, talking about the persecution, and uh, with the persecution of Jerusalem, the gospel gets spread uh, throughout uh, the, uh, the Middle East. In verse 19, it says, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen, when Stephen's martyr, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. That's our uh, Antioch, Syria. Preaching the word to no one but Jews only. Verse 20, but, in contrast to that, but some of the, uh, them were men from Cyprus, not from Jerusalem, from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, or the Greeks, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was upon them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Uh, there's, uh, again, we, we can make a pretty good case to say Luke is, uh, is in that group. He's a Gentile. Uh, we believe that he is uh, a Greek. Uh, and the reason that we believe is uh, he's a great couple of circumstantial things. One, we can, we can make a case that, uh, that he is the brother of Titus. And Titus, we know, is, is Greek. Uh, there's a couple of references, and I, I, want, I don't want to go into a lot of detail on, on this and everything, but this kind of thing fascinates you. Uh, go online and listen to David Hawkins' message on his background. He says 40, 40 minutes on just this, uh, this subject. Uh, was, was Luke the, uh, the brother of Titus? Uh, in Scripture, we have a reference to the brother of Titus on a couple of occasions. He's going to go with Titus to take this offering among the Gentile churches and back to Jerusalem who are going through a famine, they're going through persecution and so forth, try to help them out. He is a person that is not mentioned because the whole church, all the churches know him. Uh, you all know the brother, but here's Titus. You don't know him, but you know the brother. So it's like, okay... And you go through the process of elimination. Uh, well, it, it, uh, it couldn't be the apostle. Uh, it couldn't be Barnabas. He's Jewish. You know, you've you got to eliminate the, the, the Jewish guys. and the, Who's left in terms of Gentiles? Uh, it's not Timothy. At this point in time, he's not well known. He becomes more known as time goes on. Anyway, Luke becomes a very, a very viable candidate. And then there's a couple of other little things to kind of throw in here from secular history. Uh, there's some there's some other folks that are uh, uh, well-known Romans and uh, and have a notoriety in Roman history, uh, and they named their son after Dr. Luke. Uh, uh, that that kid uh, grows up and becomes a uh, a Roman poet. He's got two kind of semi-famous uh, uncles. One of them is uh, is the Roman poet philosopher Seneca. In one of the letters that we have from Seneca, he is writing to his good friend Theophilus back in Antioch, Syria. Very interesting. His other uncle is a guy named uh, Gallio. And we'll see in our study in the book of Acts, he's a proconsul. And when Paul and Luke are brought before him, he says, you guys get out of here. <laughs> it's like, did you know him? Is he like an uncle or something? It's a long story. But they... Uh, it, it's very, very interesting. Uh, of course, there's a, there's a couple of very early church historians that make a case for Luke being uh, the brother of Titus and a Gentile uh, and a Greek. Uh, David kind of tracks it all down. It's, uh, it's kind of a fascinating study in itself. Uh, but uh, uh, with that implication, it makes him Greek. Uh, it places him in the right city uh, to receive the gospel and be saved with these other other Greek men. Well, that's based on conjecture uh, and some secular history, but certainly uh, uh, is, uh, is possible, and more than a few good uh, men hold to that particular view. Now, in that city, uh, again, God's doing a work up there, uh, and Barnabas is sent out to uh, reckon uh, the events taking place, what's going on. He's going to go up and do a little, little recon, see what's happening. Because there's one a little more piece of information that becomes uh, interesting here I want to mention. In Acts 11, verse 22, it says, 
Then the news of these things came to the ears of the church of Jerusalem. All these guys get saved up there, including some Greeks, uh, some non-Jews. So they sent out Barnabas. They sent Uncle Barney up to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad. And encouraged them all that with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. Now listen to verse 24. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Uh, it's, well, how, do you, how, do you, how do you know that, Luke? Yeah, it, it, you know, there, there, it almost starts sounding first person. Uh, uh, verse 25 goes on. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to uh, seek Saul, go down and bring him back up to help the church. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So uh, it was that for a whole year, they assembled with the church, uh, Saul, Paul, and Barnabas. It taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians <clears throat> in Antioch. Now, there's an ancient manuscript that has an insertion before verse 27. Uh, it's not part of Scripture because it's just, it's just only on one manuscript. Uh, but, but in this insertion in this ancient manuscript between these two verses, it says, When we were gathered, and in those days, verse 27, and in those days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch, there's an insertion that, Paul, that Luke is writing in the first person when he's describing these events. Now, it's not in Scripture, but it means that early church uh, historians, somebody believed that Luke was there, he was saved at that time, and he's writing in first person when he's describing the events of Barnabas coming and then bringing Barnabas and then ministering the word uh, for an entire year before they ever launch out on their first uh, missionary journeys. So it's very interesting. A little background uh, on our writer. Luke's a fellow worker. Well, we know for sure he's a fellow worker of Paul. He's out preaching the gospel uh, in some very difficult situations. What Paul's going through, he's going through as well. When Paul is shipwrecked, he is shipwrecked uh, is, as well. When Paul is driven out of town, he's driven out of town as well. He's the guy that stays with them no matter what through the entire lifetime in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. He's the only one left when he's in the Maritime prison there in Rome awaiting his death. He's the guy that buries the Apostle Paul. So all of that should give us a greater appreciation for our, our writer. Uh, the purpose uh, and the theme is very important. It lays out models for us to follow in ministry. There's some wonderful uh, uh, particular characteristics of, uh, of his writing that are different from others uh, in terms of the, the literary style and excellence as well as the uh, dramatic descriptions. Uh, it's a, a previous account. It's a continuation from the gospel. It's a tie-in with this man, Theophilus. And then fourth, he mentions uh, the proof of the resurrection. That's in verse 3. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during the 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Luke's the only one that tells us how long Jesus was around. Between his death, his resurrection, his ascension, he's the one that tells us it was for 40 days, and for a 40-day period. He also tells us that uh, uh, it, the reliability or the proof included uh, some, uh, some very keen witnesses, verse 3 at the end, being seen by them, seen by many people many times, and certainly one of them was the Apostle John. John says in 1 John 1, 1, uh, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, speaking of Jesus, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you that uh, you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And these things that we write to you, that your joy may be full. So John is one of those guys. Uh, uh, Peter is one of those guys. Now, I won't read it, but uh, Peter begins his epistle, uh, second epistle in uh, the chapter 1, verse 6 to 18, describing being on the Mount of Transfiguration and so forth. Uh, men that saw him, that saw him over that period of, uh, of 40 days. Men whose lives were changed, who were skeptics. Uh, you remember the fact that when Jesus uh, appears to them uh, in the upper room, the first thing he does is rebuke them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. 
Men and women, he says, have been coming here all day telling you about my resurrection. You still don't believe. That was the first thing Jesus said. These guys are, are changed because of the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ, because they saw him. That's one of the proofs, reliable, reliable witnesses. And I want to give you uh, five others very quickly. Of course, we've done entire messages on this, and uh, volumes have been written. We often say that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most easily proven fact of all antiquity uh, because of all of the uh, sheer uh, <coughs> volume of evidence. One, five real quick, and again, just to say that uh, when it says uh, infallible proofs, the Greek word there means to prove with absolute certainty. Uh, Luke is saying these things have been proven with absolute certainty based on eyewitness accounts. And then the empty tomb. All the Jews had to do, uh, and all the Romans had to do, uh, to stop the spread of Christianity is just produce a body. But, uh, uh, but they couldn't. And of course, remember, uh, what they did do is pay off the Roman guard, who normally would have been executed for allowing someone to uh, escape. Uh, they were held there by death to uh, guard the tomb with a Roman seal on it. Uh, but again, when the uh, stone is rolled away, the angel appears, uh, they flee, uh, and Jesus uh, uh, rises from, from the dead. All they had to do uh, is produce the body, but they couldn't. There was, uh, there was an empty tomb. Of course, they spread the rumor, well, the apostles, the apostles took the body. Oh, really? How do we get those guys? Well, actually, they're right down there in the temple. You know, they didn't run off somewhere. Uh, they were there. There was an empty tomb. And then the many appearances. Uh, Jesus uh, appears at different intervals. Uh, we would say he, he stepped in and out of the time-space continuum uh, on several occasions. He appears to Mag Mary Magdalene first, later to her, and one of the other Marys, to Simon Peter, to the two men on the Emmaus Road, the ten apostles in the upper room, the appearance to Thomas uh, eight days after the resurrection, uh, he meets with them, breathes on them. They receive uh, the Holy Spirit and uh, I would say are born again uh, at that point in time. Uh, of course, they still don't go out preaching the gospel. They go, some of them anyway, go fishing after that. Jesus appears to uh, them at that point in time uh, and says what uh, all fishermen uh, love to hear as they're coming in. Uh, Have you caught anything? No, 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 not, re not, re not really. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then he tells them to throw their net on the other side. And then it's such a catch that even Peter, is, as big of a guy as he was, is not able to bring the nets in. Uh, Paul makes a very important reference in 1 Corinthians 15 that at one point in time, Jesus appears to over 500 people at one time. Some would say, well, I, they just really wanted to see him. I think they were kind of hallucinating. Really? 500 people all having the same hallucination simultaneously? Uh, no, that's... Uh, that's not gonna gonna happen. Uh, again, the appearances. Then to James, his half brother, and you remember his brothers and sisters, half brothers and sisters, did not believe in him until after the resurrection. James becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem, and then finally we'll look at his ascension next week. Again, Luke writing in, uh, in his gospel, in chapter 24, verse 36 says, uh, "Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in their midst." And, then, and said to them, Shalom, or peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. But when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still not, did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food uh, here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, uh, and he took it and, uh, and ate it uh, in their presence. I'm not sure if it was ahi or not, but it could have been. It was just broiled fish. But I uh, uh, <coughs> hate to say it was probably tilapia. But uh, uh, at any rate, uh, I'm just encouraged that in our resurrected body we get to eat. I, I, that's the only reason I read that. I just wanted to, some of you, that might be a concern. But he shows up and he says, touch me. Uh, it's a bodily, physical resurrection. Something that most main, mainline denominations in this country today absolutely deny. They'll say, oh, do you believe Jesus rose from the dead? Oh, yeah, he rose from the dead. Yeah, we believe that. 
Can you describe it to me? It was like a spirit, you know. It was just, you know, you know, they wanted to see, so they saw, but they, no. Uh, Jesus says he rose. He says, you know, see me. I've got flesh, flesh and bone here. Touch me uh, and see. I'm not just a spirit. He physically rose from the dead. Uh, three. He continued to do miracles during this period of time. Four. The, again, we've mentioned the dramatic change in uh, in the disciples, and. Uh, how they went from uh, uh, being nervous and fearful and afraid, locked in an upper room, to uh, after the day of Pentecost, after seeing the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, they're out preaching the gospel. And all of them continue to preach until they're martyred for their faith, uh, except the apostle John, who there were attempts to martyr him, like boiling him in water uh, and oil and so forth, uh, to no avail. And eventually they, they put him on the Isle of Patmos, where then later he receives the revelation uh, of Jesus Christ that we have as the last book uh, in the Bible. Uh, the subsequent events of history, uh, Peter preaching, 3,000 being saved. Uh, again, these are the events of the book of Acts. One writer said the proof of Christianity is not a book but a life. The power of Christianity is not a creed but a Christian character. And whenever you see life that has been transformed by the grace of God, you see a witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The only reason any of us are ever changed or transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because of his ascension and sending that Holy Spirit on us that we might be changed and be made to be more like him. These ordinary men and women turned the world upside down in one generation. They were just ordinary uh, but they receive the power of the Holy Spirit upon our lives. The best evidence we can give for the, for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's important to know the historical information uh, to be able to give people reasons for faith in Jesus, but the best uh, evidence is a transformed life. And that's what we're going to pray for, is that we'll be transformed as we study and watch what God did through these men and women. Warren Wormsley says the book of Acts is also the account of how the work of the Holy Spirit in and through the church. The Gospel of Luke records what Jesus began both to do and to teach in his human body. And the book of Acts tells us what Jesus continued to do and teach through his spiritual body, <coughs> the church. And uh, sometimes we say we're, we're living in Acts 29. <laughs> and the writing ends at 28, but uh, the same work of the Spirit continues uh, in the church today. If we're open to it, if we'll receive it, uh, if we'll place our faith in what God wants to do in and through our lives, uh, we'll be amazed that we can do what was done uh, in the pages that we're about ready to study. We'll meet at the river We will be delivered of every chain Down into the water, children, mothers, and fathers, in your sweet name. The drown on the
Never.